Are you struggling to reduce your cybersecurity risks and meet compliance mandates? Wishing you could be proactive instead of reactive? You need a solution that integrates cybersecurity together to make it affordable, accessible from anywhere, and simplistic, so you can gain a return on investment on your resources. Cyrisma is your answer. It gives you a single interface to identify sensitive data, vulnerable systems, insecure configurations, track progress, and assign accountability. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash Cyrisma today for a seven-day test drive and impress your leadership. That's Cyrisma, C-Y-R-I-S-M-A. Welcome back to Security and Compliance Weekly. Hey, if you have any specific guests or topic ideas that you would love for us to cover on any of our shows, submit your suggestions for guests by going to securityweekly.com forward slash guests and filling out the form. We'll review it uh, and get back to you if we like your idea. Also, our next webcast is coming up on March 18th at 11 a.m. That'll be Eastern Daylight Time by now, I believe, where you will learn how to prepare Linux hosts for unexpected hackers like JT or threats, as the script says. Uh, You can go uh, sign up for it, register for it, by going to securityweekly.com forward slash webcast. Also, if you've missed any of our webcasts or technical trainings, you can always go to securityweekly.com forward slash on demand and peruse our portfolio. All right, back to the discussion. Flea, without any ado, take it over and introduce our next guests. Yes, yes, yes. So, so super excited now to also welcome Chris Cochran and Ronald Eddings. You, some of you might already know them as the hosts of Hacker Valley Studio um, to the show. And, and part of the uh, motivation here is, you know, drawing that link between, you know, like people like JT that actually were inspirations for many of us in cybersecurity to a lot of these up and coming uh, professionals. And, and, and it's difficult to actually say that Chris and Ron are up and coming because they've actually been here for a minute. Um, but yeah, would love to actually hear a little bit about more about them and their journey. And, and also wanted to chat a little bit about JT, about that bridge from, you know, that original generation to some of us that, that are a little bit newer and, and, you know, like his role in inspiring a lot of us actually getting into security. Yeah. Yeah. So, so Chris, Ron, uh, you know, I'm not going to talk too much, Ron, about you and all your tight fitting shirts. We'll, we'll leave that to the discord <laughs> later. Um, <laughs> <laughs> would love for both of you to kind of introduce yourselves and tell us a little bit about how y'all got into security as well. Um, you know, I think both of you have really, really interesting stories, uh, you know, just as colorful as JT, but obviously from, from a little different uh, slant. Yeah, I can kick us off. Uh, I'm a son of cybersecurity. Cybersecurity has been like a parent to me. It's taught me good. It's taught me bad. It's taught me how to do things the right and wrong way. And it's also supported me throughout my life. I got my in, my start into cybersecurity from someone like JT. I was a son of the game and I got hacked. And this was early on. I was probably around 13 or 14 years old. Me and my friends, we used to love jumping on AOL Instant Messenger and talking crap. We would talk about Kobe, Shaq, all of our favorite players. And then we were in this chat room and someone sent me a direct message. It's a capability of AOL Instant Messenger. And I opened up a file. They sent me a file. I opened it and my computer went crazy. All hell broke loose. And I'm 13 or 14 at the time. So having my computer, my family computer have malware on it was a huge issue. So I was trying to load it back up. And ultimately, I got back into the chat room after they stopped making my CD drive open and making my computer restart. I got back into the chat room and I asked the person, how did you do it? And luckily for me, I don't know why they did, but they told me they were using a tool called ProRad. And I'm sure JT and all the OGs can relate back to this tool. But that's how I really got my start into the game and my first exposure. Um, I was a tinkerer for a long time. Being Black from the East Coast, I didn't have a lot of people that looked like me that could tell me how to learn more about cybersecurity. So I was tinkering from probably... 13, 14 to 18. And that's when I met a mutual contact that me and Jeff both know very well, Marcus Carey. He took me under his wing and he put me on the game. He said, hey, Ron, if you get these certifications and study for this amount of time and talk to these people and do your networking, you can for sure make a break into cybersecurity. So that's exactly what I did. I had a very fortunate start um, to do that. And I've been in cybersecurity ever since I was 18 and 12 years later, still here. 
Absolutely. That, and I'm Chris Cochran, the, the other co-host. Uh, I got in, I've been a lifelong tinkerer, much like Ron. My first computer was a Commodore 64, if that tells you anything. Um, I, and I found this field by the Marine Corps. I was at the, in the United States Marine Corps for several years. I was at the National Security Agency. Uh, I was at United States Cyber Command, had my own company for a little bit. Um, but the interesting thing is, is listening to JT's origin, it's not very different than Ron and myself. It, it's almost like this exponential curve that getting into cybersecurity today is completely different than when we were getting in and a little different than when uh, JT was coming in. So it's inc incredible just to see the difference in, in the way people are getting in these days. No, I, I think that's interesting. And one of the things actually I love about you two and Hacker Valley Studio just in general is just how out there y'all are. Um, and, and like I know that there are other people that are, you know, underrepresented minorities or people who are actually just interested in security that actually see you and see your stories and, and how approachable that is. And, and actually, I would love to actually bring JT into this uh, question as well. What is it like uh, to essentially kind of like be a, a prominent role model within security, bringing other people into it? And, you know, JT probably gets tired of me gushing about like how influential he was in my life. But I know that you two are also like, you know, kind of like the next generation of JTs getting other people uh, interested in security. And we'd just love to hear a little bit more about all of y'all's perspectives about kind of being a role model in security um, and motivating other people to actually take up the mantle. Yeah, I'll go ahead and start. Uh, we just put out a, a special called We Are Here, and it's all about black excellence and cybersecurity. And the reason why we did is because we wanted to show people that aren't in cybersecurity, people that come from where we come from, that look like us, that there are other avenues other than entertainment or playing sports to get them out of their socioeconomic situation. And so we wanted to say we are here. We're, we're highlighting different folks. Uh, we just uh, highlighted Congresswoman Yvette Clark, who is now the uh, chair of the Homeland Security Cybersecurity Subcommittee. And so just highlighting powerful folks like this. So you can see examples of people that look like you that are doing great things. When I got to Netflix, you, that's when everything really started for me. I said, I got to use this as my way to show everybody that, hey, we are here. We made it. If I can make it, you can make it. And uh, we haven't stopped making so making noise since. And going back to that story that I was mentioning about getting hacked for the first time, you know, as a young kid, what did I do to my friends after this person sent me the file? I sent them the same file and did the same thing to them and really brought them into the <laughs> same situation that I I was in. All of my friends are in cybersecurity because of mentorship, not only mentorship that I provided them, but for mentorship that I was also given. I mentioned Marcus Carey. He was a, a great influence in my life. And also Chris Cochran. And even talking to you, Flea, um, just hearing all the great things about you. I didn't, we didn't, we just met pretty recently. And I feel like through other people talking so much about you and hearing how you've influenced them, you've also become an, a, a mentor to me. Oh, well, that, that's definitely not my doing. That's me paying it forward. I would love to actually hear, hear from JT because I know, you know, it's funny because when I talk to other black hackers, especially people that are close to my generation, um, et cetera, like everybody, it's like, oh, yeah, I want to be like corrupt. You know, I, I want to, you know, mm -hmm. I want to be like John Threat. I want to do this whole nine. So, so JT, I'm actually kind of curious, like, how does that hit you now? Because I know you've been pretty humble about it. But how do you view your, your role in the like security community? Well, I mean, I definitely talk to people like every day, even though like I, I only do security like on special um, occasions at the moment, um, since I have like another like another two other careers that I <laughs> develop. Um, but, yeah, I used to do security for companies and then uh, I worked for a company for a while. I'm not going to name. And then I actually did uh, computer security, believe it or not, for two different billionaires. It was kind of there. Like almost like um, nowadays, like if you're a billionaire, you probably need like a, a like a like in the old days, like the king needed a wizard. You almost need like your hacker, like familiar that like, you know what I mean? To navigate these complex worlds. Um, but for me, in terms of influencing people, like I just talk to people anytime I get a chance. If someone sends someone my way, I'd speak to them about it and introduce them to people. I definitely am a little more on the. Um, hidden side of things. I definitely, 
Uh, in fact, I would even say a lot of people um, I work with don't even know I'm a hacker. I don't really use it. Don't talk about it um, as much, um, mostly because I will also say like in my jaunt through um, through corporate security, um, definitely I met people who are not fond of the fact that I went to jail. Like some people are very, uh, do not um, enjoy speaking to people who went to jail. Um, the irony, of course, is that if you wait 10 or 10, 10 years, when they get charged with something, it's interesting to see the look on their faces. But the main thing is that um, that is something I bumped into into security every once in a while. The idea that like, you know, uh, like, yeah, we got to get him out of here. This guy got uh, he was uh, he went to jail. So um, but I don't think that that is a road bump in um, security at all. Like um, there's definitely many, many different positions that people um, are able to ascend to. And also in terms of. Um, influence um, people of color, I definitely um, very um, impressed with um, the growing number of people that feel um, to jump into the field. There was a room on Clubhouse recently for uh, uh, black professionals that wanted to get into cybersecurity. I was actually, the room was like crazy big. Like I couldn't believe how many people wanted to get in. So I took some time on there to explain to people what, what, um, what they should do without necessarily, I didn't mention anything about myself, um, just gave them advice. I think um, I'm, I'm very pleased. I mean, I think that I'd love to see a, a, a evolution of, of definitely more people getting in um, earlier in, in the way. Like I do think like right now it's like sort of still self-motivated. I was touched on that a little bit, but I definitely would love to see like more evolution on these ideas um, um, in high school, for instance. No, I, I love that you, you bring that up, JT, and, and I want to talk talk to to you, Ron and Chris, because you know one of the things that JT and I connected on was a, a gentleman, Matt Mitchell, who you know r- you know started Crypto Harlem. Uh, you know he's at the Ford Foundation, actually helping other people essentially use security as part of their activism. And I've noticed like there are a lot of people of color, women, et cetera, who actually are getting into security you know, for the activism aspects of it, you know, kind of like the, the original things that some of it actually got started in, like, yeah, you know, using security to help either protect ourselves for people that actually are dissidents, et cetera, um, using security, you know, and some of the, the practices we actually have learned to be able to actually find information out about, you know, other people on the political spectrum. I would love to hear from you two about your feelings on that intersection of hacking and activism. I think the the intersection there is great. Uh, There are so many opportunities. We're going through a huge state of digital transformation. Now, the Crypto Harlem that you just mentioned, I'm going to be on those live streams uh, this Friday. So just having the opportunity to be supporting these groups that are, you know, fighting the same cause, promoting diversity in technology. It's incredible. Um, And being here with you all right now through Zoom, through YouTube and all the other streaming platforms, uh, now we can all participate in in the in the specific things that we're really interested in influencing, like diversity in tech. And at that that confluence is is something really magical because I really believe that cybersecurity and technology in general is a socioeconomic equalizer. It, it there's mm-hmm. something about the dollar that just brings power and influence, and so we could use that for our communities, and vice versa. We could use the all the help that we can get in cybersecurity to help keep people safe on the internet. Uh, JT earlier was talking about hip hop and cybersecurity, like w- there was a confluence there. In fact, that's like one of the main premises for Hacker Valley Studio. We feel like we are the, the hip hop version of cybersecurity podcasting. So that speaks to a, a different generation. It's, it speaks to a different demographic. So we want to be as inclusive as we can, bringing people together. And in fact, we're doing so many other things from, from the, the activism standpoint, the, the representation standpoint. And we have some really, really special projects coming up here soon. You know, no, it, I- it's, it's, it's funny. Back when we were, so, sorry, I'm going to jump in here. Uh, back when we were doing this whole thing called going to conferences, uh, I remember <laughs> I remember uh, uh, listening to Paul Asadorian give his uh, speech on uh, how how Wu Tang taught me everything about hacking, and I and I <laughs> I hear you guys talking about things, and I'm sitting here saying to myself, "Cash rules everything around me." You know, yeah. it's like <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah, you can't get around it. Now, I, I want to take this in just a slightly slightly different direction. We as 
the 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 uh, uh, the next the next generation that's going to be running a lot of things. We we like to feel that we can empower people at all levels to come and enjoy the craft that has taught us so much. And how we do that is very interesting. One of the things that I heard you gentlemen talking about earlier was get these certifications, talk to these people, do these things. You'll be able to make into it, right? Uh, the other thing that I've heard is that certifications, I'm sorry, the, the degree gets you the job, the certs get you the money. Unfortunately, right now, and Johnny, if you want to bring that graphic up, uh, unfortunately, right now, there are no less than 375 certifications inside of the security community. Uh, here it is right here. Uh, and the graphic, for those of you who are listening, uh, really lays out uh, security across IAM, network security, security architecture, asset security, risk management. Uh, software security and SOC or security operations. Uh, it, it, gents, if you could, and I'm going to drop the link in the Discord for everybody who's on it, the Discord. If you're listening, um, go find the video of it and look at this thing because there's no words to describe <laughs> what we're seeing. There's right not. This it, it's craziness. Um, if 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 I had to say uh, to the three of you where to start in getting certifications or where somebody should focus that's either trying to get into the field is junior or mid-level in the field where does somebody begin in that path if you guys could point that out we just created a framework called exist and exist is all about pursuing uh mm -hmm. endeavors and humanity in general and one of the things that you pursue in tech and cybersecurity is like which path you want to take the exists is it's an acronym it's explore immerse study and translate when you are getting into cybersecurity, you're essentially stepping into a new world you're stepping into unknown and uncertainties and there's a lot of different certifications that you can pick from looking at that graphic but the first thing that you have to do is explore you have to step into this new world and really understand what's in it what are the rules what are the boundaries and what are the rules that you're going to break along the way and when you look at those graphics, it's intimidating, but that shows you that the, the field is so ripe. There's so many different paths that you can take, so many different places where you can focus. So I would really encourage anyone that wants to break into the field, start with one thing, explore it, immerse yourself in it, study that, 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 that field, learn the boundaries, learn the rules, break, break them all and see where you end up and then translate those skills into projects, into interviews and enhance your resume and ultimately teach others. Because when you teach people, you get to learn it twice. But I think it's really about starring with the exploration, looking at that graphic and picking something and just exploring around. What, where can we learn more about this exist framework? <laughs> we 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 have a bunch of resources on it that was one of the premises of we are here highlighting bipoc excellence for hacker valley studio but we just uh, actually did a youtube video yesterday about exist it was a use case that chris and i have both done chris has used exist for dancing i've used it to learn more about mindfulness and meditation and that's one of the things we love talking about is kind of the exploration and and mastery of all endeavors. You know, I, I think um, it's interesting that y'all are talking about this mastery of, of endeavors. And, and one of the things that I've noticed about, you know, you two and Hacker Valley Studio is that, you know, security being a hacker, that's not not your only persona. Right. And, and I think that the same thing with JT and I would love to hear a little bit more about like the other outlets, like, like the other things that you kind of apply your I guess, hacker mindset and, and, you know, some of the things that we kind of like hold as like core values to some of these other pursuits. Like I, it's clear that all of y'all love the exploration of knowledge. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, we use it for everything. Ron and I, we've brought on coaches for storytelling. We've brought on vocal coaches to, to fix our voices, to improve. And this is all in support of our speaking. This is in support of our podcast. We dissect everything and break it down to its, its most fine components and then develop those components until we can't get it wrong. And so that's all the way across the board. Right now I'm using Exist for chess. I started chess two and a half months ago or something like that. And I've been in two tournaments. I have a coach, I have books. 
I have uh, training courses that I'm taking. I'm, we're constantly pushing the envelope on the things that we have. So Hacker Valley Studio is, is not just about cybersecurity and hacking bits and bytes. It's about hacking life. It's about hacking leadership, activism, our communities. It's about leveling up everything across the board. So um, I wanted to ask a question, if I may. Um, and I, and I and I want to take a, a you know a, a moment to say as a, a representing uh, you know a, a middle aged white guy that uh, is passionate about social justice and equal opportunity and would like to think that most of society wants everybody to have a fair shake. Um, uh, this is for you, by the way, Chris. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, I know. I appreciate it. Can we blur um, that out somehow? Can we blur that? No, no, we can't. It's my show. We'll blur your shirt out. Honey. But uh, it, you know, I, I think about stupid stuff like the the you know we talk about stereotypes in the hacking community, and we think about that you know the kid in the basement with the hoodie. It's a skinny, scrawny white kid with with very little exposure to sun. Um, you, and does that matter or not to, to to people of color? Let me shut up and let me ask the question. You know, what are what are things that uh, all of us can do to help you, even if it's just get out of the way and let you guys hack your way into something that's not necessarily traditionally stereotypically something that's your your domain? Thoughts from anybody? Maybe from JT first and then on, and set me straight if I need to be set straight. Uh, well, what I would say is that I think, I mean, from my personal take, I feel like things have gotten better, um, uh, by, uh, by quite a margin, um, just in general, how society has, uh, changed. Obviously there's lots of things that, um, need to be worked on, but I also think those things are being worked on. Um, um, I like, uh, I just want to mention that, like, definitely when I first started that definitely, I think that that um, phenotype was promoted um, and it probably did do a lot of damage. I think there's still a lot of work to be done. Um, I definitely see it online when a lot of times I see uh, people attack women um, who are in security um, viciously and they don't even seem to realize they're like all piling on. Like it's like, like it's like a, like rabbit dogs. Like they're like, Oh, well there's one, one person made one, one mistake or said the wrong thing, not even a mistake, but literally, misspoke i don't know and then they 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 jump on as this opportunity to see someone as they see weak and attack and they don't even realize that from the macro it's like yo you're like making like a self-reinforcing wall to like attack someone who is you know trying to make their space in the industry um um i haven't i i i and definitely in terms of like for myself, I mean, I know for a fact that like I, you know, I worked some places where, you know, I was told to leave because it was somebody who, um, you know, um, um, for reasons that are um, probably uh, related to uh, the things you're talking about, um, mm -hmm. you know, they 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 said uh, that this guy shouldn't work here um, um, because they they didn't like me for based on uh, <clears throat> related to uh, how I look. Um, right. but I would say nowadays that doesn't really happen. And that person has been isolated and everybody knows him for what he is. But I think that just in general, um, um, things are getting uh, better on that front. Ron, Chris, there, there's a, there's a lot to unpack there. Um, as it stands <laughs> today, the average household income for a black family is 58,000. And that's considerably less than the average income for uh, other other uh, racial groups. I think that just like with the LGBTQIA community, um, what anyone can do is be an ally to anyone that is underrepresented, discriminated towards. I think that's the the power of having the A and all of those acronyms and having an ally out of out of anyone. So just helping promote people to close the gap out when it comes to freedom. And that's not just freedom economically, that's freedom of opportunity, that's freedom of the mind. There's a lot of things that I think we all want. We want opportunities we want money but at the end of the day what we really want is freedom so i think help being an ally to help people become free in all aspects is really the way to go
Yep. Allyship is super important. And also some of these social media movements. One of the coolest social media move- movements I've been a part of is uh, this is what a hacker looks like. Because it, 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 mm. it kind of dispels that you got to be in a basement with a, a black hoodie uh, as, a, as a white male. Like that, that's not the case at all. You can be a, a powerful black woman. You could be uh, minorities across the board. You could be from a different country. You could dress a different way. You can listen to different music and be a hacker, which I think is beautiful because there's beauty and diversity and there's power and diversity. So the more that we can dispel this, this pre uh, existing notion that this is exactly what a hacker looks like, the, the better it's going to be for the next generation, the people that hey, I don't look like that. So I'm not going to be a hacker. That, that, that That's not me at all. But if you see an example of yourself in somebody else, it makes it a lot easier for you to pave your own path. I, I definitely agree with, with, you know, the impact of having somebody actually that, that looks like you. I, I mean, like, you know, I know that for me, it was instrumental, like, you know, seeing and reading about JT like early in his career and things like that. It's like, oh, this is this is possible for me that the whole if, if I can see it, I can be it. And, you know, and I think about, you know, even, you know, on, on this show and others where we actually get to give platforms and actually feature people like, you know, the, you know, I was talking to a group last week and actually I, I know, Chris, you even on that, you know, uh, we were talking last week because just like impromptu, we created like a little security happy hour just for cybersecurity professionals that are black just in the Bay Area. And we had like something like, you know, probably like 50 or so people that were signed up coming in and out. Now it's completely organic. Um, and being able to actually make these communities foster that, et cetera, is actually really, really deeply impactful. But also it's impactful to see other people share their platforms and give avenues for other people to actually speak. Like there's a lot of, uh, and, and I like that JT was already talking about not just the racial diversity that's in our community, but also the, the gender diversity and things like that. Like there are some really great security leaders out there. Like, hey, you know, we have like Lisa Hall at PagerDuty, for example, you know, building a security team there, that could be a global recognized company. Um, you know, Colin Coolidge, you know, over at Segment slash Twilio, you know, we have like Window Snyder. I mean, I, I would include her as, as an OG, et cetera. Like all these people that, you know, are women that sometimes we even forget about are, are not necessarily actually given the same platform to. And I think it's actually one of the things that we can do better as a security community is, uh, you know, for lack of a better word, using the hashtag here is actually just share the mic, um, mm-hmm. giving these other people access, allowing their brands, allowing the other people to actually discover them. Because somewhere out there, there is a like younger flea who's excited now because he actually gets to see, you know, Chris. And, and Ron, you know, he might get some body dysmorphia because of Ron and all his tight T-shirts and workouts. <laughs> but, you know, there, there are people out there that need to see those people. There, there are people out there who get super excited if they got to see somebody like Lisa Hall. Like, it's like, oh, well, hey, that, that, that's a woman who's super successful in security. I want to actually be, uh, you know, featured like that as well. So I think it's actually one of the hey. things that we can do as a community to, to help bring up and bring in more people. Let me jump in real yeah. quick. I know Ron and and Chris. They, they, you know, this is a live broadcast. They need to they need to jump. I don't want to stop the conversation. We can keep going with JT and and and, and the rest of us. But uh, Ron and Chris, real quick, any parting thoughts? And then you know, feel free to jump, and we'll we'll talk a little bit longer, probably about you. Go. <laughs> All good. No, appreciate the time. Uh, appreciate the conversation. We love stuff like this. Definitely reach out anytime. If, if you want to catch up with us, it's really easy. Uh, HackerValley.com is where we're at. Reach out to us on LinkedIn. That's where we live. <laughs> so uh, thanks for everything. And let's keep supporting each other moving forward. Yes, thank great. you. And that was a great sentiment you shared, Flea, um, about just sharing the mic sh- and sharing the platforms. You know, that's why we built the podcast. We want to give cybersecurity a voice and really appreciate you all for sharing your platform with us as well. All right. Thanks a lot, guys. Yeah, thanks a lot. And, uh, thank you. And and JT, if you don't mind, if we can keep you a little bit longer, because I, I feel like we're in the middle. I've got so many questions, and I'm sure Scott and Flea do yeah, too. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. Um. Just to wrap up that other question, though, um, I just yep. realized that me and Matt Mitchell actually held a like a like a uh, on the on the hidden side uh, an event at uh, the last in person DEF CON um, where we had uh, people of color and when we had people of color we had everybody like there's like it was open in a way it was open but it was you know specifically to pull in people of color and women into. Um, um, and actually, you know, all, all on everyone, um, into 
a, a special party that we had. And then we had like a talk there and stuff. It wasn't sponsored or anything. I probably could get it sponsored. I just put my own money up and so did Matt. And um, we just did it on the, you know, on the hidden side. It was actually pretty successful and super crowded. Um, um, I thought about, unfortunately, you know, COVID hit. So um, we weren't able to do it this year. I definitely thought about just like, you know, I, I work in entertainment and I thought about like getting maybe a music artist to come and just do it separately. Um, you know, it's at the same time as DEF CON. Um, I thought about a sponsor, but we'll see. Um, I think ultimately, like I didn't mind just putting up my own money to uh, to have it, to get a suite and just have people rock out and talk and network and then get fucked up. It was good. <laughs> I wanted to pivot on something that Flea was talking about uh, in terms of the importance of seeing people that look like you, because as a white person in this world, that's not something that I often have to think about. But what I do think about is, in terms of my experiences uh, in my career and in the hacker security community, it's it's being around like-minded people, being around people that... Uh, being around hackers, being around people that think differently and, and view things differently and have that curiosity and inquisitiveness. And what I think is what I enjoy about the hacker community is there's so many people from so many walks of life. We all tend to be a little bit different. We all tend to be a little bit uh, on the fringe within our own social groups. Uh, and, and yet we have, we find some place where we can all, maybe it's a tribal thing, but we all find some place where we have people that understand that we see things differently from everybody else. I, I mean, and I, I have to believe, I hope that that extends into people of all colors. It doesn't matter what your skin color is. Um, d does that resonate at all? I mean, you know, people that look like you, is that also people that think like you? Um, I think so. I mean, for me, the hacker community, like I, like I said, I'm part of a, of a huge hacker community. I speak to people every day. Um, mm -hmm. and like, I don't really think about like those, um, elements that the community is quite diverse. Um, right. you know, obviously there's, a, <laughs> there's a whole other, um, actually group of, um, hackers that are, uh, racist that, um, I'm not going to name yeah. them here, um, for various reasons, but like, I think well, that like, we, we mostly yeah. know who you're talking about, but go ahead. Yeah, you do. <laughs> yeah, you do. Um, but that being said, um, you know, that's a small that's an outlier group. I mean, for the most part, I do think, um, that is, I, I welcome the diversity. Let me, let me, let me wheel back a little bit to the other question about certificates, even though that's not necessarily my expertise per se, but let mm -hmm. me, let me tell a hacker story. So within like the hacker groups, and this is not something I think that is illustrated very often. Um, when you have like a group, a lot of times people are like specialized, like there's people who are really good at systems, some at a specific style of system, some are better at networks and topology and unwinding that. Some are better at picking targets. Some are better at social engineering. And that's how you really, a lot of times, put together a really good team. And that translates to like tiger teams where you had people working, uh, whether it's in pen testing or on other levels of um, security jobs. Um, you you would have a team of people with different strengths, including, you know, physical security. Right. And obviously there was some skills overlapped and you could fill the gap if that person was missing. But the reason I'm mentioning that is because I think it's like that where certificates like a lot of people look at it and they think, well, I can't I'm never going to be good at breaking systems. I tried. But that's not the only job like there's other jobs in terms of like understanding policy, setting policy thinking about things on a global scale, how they affect things in terms of nation states, um, diplomacy, there's um, risk management, there's um, mm -hmm. ideas about um, 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 within within the technical sphere, there's different spheres that people um, specialize in. And until you examine all those things, you don't know where you might fall on that list. I mean, maybe it's even journalism or hacktivism which also just to touch on the hacktivism thing, like that's something that um, I participated in. And I think like, it's interesting that there's people in the world who um, don't have a voice and the thing that's helping them get a voice is 
using technology to be able to raise their voices and their concerns and their plight on an international stage. And there's people that dedicate their life to working on these hacktivist causes. And I, I play a part in that where I can. Um, 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 at the moment, I won't name the organizations only because I'm a little, you know, I don't want to um, have, from my point of view, just because of who I am, I don't want to have undue focus on those organizations for those who want to, um, the nation states that might want to upset those organizations. But ultimately, mm -hmm. there's so many different roles that you could go into where security could play a part. So if that's something that's interesting to you, like, for instance, you know, um, democracy in other countries, or even if it's not democracy, just a fair, a fair government for um, for a country and the people, that is something that you could work on on various levels from the nation state to NGOs. Um, there's a myriad of ways that um, are interesting and could capture people and find ways that they would find a way to participate with these skills and make a living at it as well. Wow. Flea, what are your thoughts? Yes. No, I, I, I kind of wanted to, to expand a little bit on something you actually said, JT, because you think about like, you know, the crews that you ran with exactly you said, like th those were teams. And you think about like, you know, quote unquote, corporate security or whatever. Those are ultimately teams. Also, I think one of the teams that we forget about that you mentioned was, was physical security. And I, and I would love to maybe hear a little bit more about your perspective on the importance of that, um, where it actually comes into play, both on the black hat side, but also people who are supposed to be defenders, et cetera. Uh, well, I mean, I keep a Starbucks smock in case I ever have to do uh, physical security <laughs> testing again. Let me tell you the fastest way in. Just have a, a, a tray of Starbucks and a Starbucks smock and be like, yo, the CEO <laughs> needs this like stat. No one's going to turn away a Starbucks dude, man. man. I'll give you a you walk right in without a security clearance. Um, that being said, um, yeah, no, I mean, I think that's another role that is not really often talked about. But I mean, I even think about it like back when we used to hack. I mean, we used to um, go in. When we got like a set of manuals, um, we got inside of a building to be able to get those manuals. Like we, we did anything that we would uh, trashing is not really talked about. But that's also like a that's also part of investigations going through trash and finding mm -hmm. out um, are people throwing away passwords. People used to do that more when it was printing. You don't really find that as much anymore. But that doesn't mean that there aren't things to be found in trash that can really, you know, upset a corporation. Um, including on the digital security side. Um, but we would do anything. I mean, there was times uh, I think we hacked like a big government system and they were doing security through obscurity. We didn't know how to uh, use the computer. So we broke into the company that broke, that made the computer and downloaded the manuals from there so we could figure out mm. how to how to <laughs> um, operate that system. Um, I think, um, I think uh, I'm only mentioning it just because there's so many different myriad of ways that, you want to keep your mind open to um, both security as well as those who might be listening to figure out new paths to break in. Um, I'm not trying to give you clues, but there they are. Well, it, it, uh, as I listen to you talk and realizing I was in the business when you were starting out, but we were sort of on <laughs> you know different ends of the spectrum, let's say, uh, I, I look forward to the day when uh, we can get together socially and not so distantly and and just swap war stories. Because I'm curious to connect the dots and see how many places we were sort of at at the same time. Oh, absolutely. Maybe not to mention, I mean, let's face Having 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 uh having had uh, uh uh the government involved in my case, you know, I can actually sure. name a shitload of fucking uh <laughs> computers mm. and networks that I actually did hack um on record. Um, but also the ones that didn't they didn't know about. <laughs> I can talk about those well, it, well and, and just you describing some of the you know, I, I haven't I I haven't personally been, you know, pen, been a pen tester. I haven't broken into things in quite a few years. I sort of took a different career path, but uh, you know, you're just bringing, you're just evoking a whole lot of memories and 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 the lessons learned. I mean, even the term "tiger team" was like, oh yeah, that's what we used to call it. I, that's I haven't what heard, we used I haven't to call that it. term right. in years, but that's what we used to call it. And I'm like, you know, because um, Ron Redding and I are in this book called "Tribe of Hackers Red Team." And I'm like, you know, they asked me to fill out the questionnaire. I'm like, well, you know, 
I don't actually know what a red team is. I don't know when that term became popular. I used right, to be a hacker not, to break into it. things. What is it? Yeah. Tiger team. Yeah. Or, Before that, it but, was tiger uh, team. Yeah, I like tiger team better, by the way. I don't like red team and blue team. And I like, uh, oh, I, like uh, uh, I, I, I totally agree because it, I mean, it's a military term. Um, but it, it implies that, you know, every, and, and one of the, one of the jobs I had when I was working for the DOD was working with the uh, U S special forces and, and they have a teams, you know, yep, uh, yep. and, and the a stood for advance or, or whatever. But yeah. I mean, everybody, everybody had a specialty, everybody was cross trained. So if somebody is for some reason incapacitated, shall we say, uh, you know, the, the work can still get done, but, yep. um, yeah, you know, that is to me. That's reassuring and comforting, and hopefully is being heard by people that are listening and watching. Is that uh, you know, it, it, and we talked on the prep call. I, I think a lot of times this whole notion of being a hacker has been co opted by a whole lot of people that want to think that they're hackers and want to want want to be hackers because you know they think we're cool, but they're but they don't have the mindset, so they're not hackers. But they can sort of practice the disciplines and. And maybe I'm alienating some people. You know, they can they can act act like and pretend like and be like hackers, but kind of like the you know following the security as a checklist thing you were talking about earlier in the first segment. There's still that extra mindset that you know. But what else? What if? What you know? Right. What are the possibilities? And that to me is what a hacker is. It's not the one that's like, okay, we're good, we're done. It's the one that's like, ah, but what else could happen? What else could be done? Yeah. We're not done. All right. Yet. So hopefully this doesn't sound duplicitous, but for me personally, I think I have two minds about it. Like on one hand, I encourage everybody. I love the warmness of bringing everybody in under the hacker family. I love it. It's amazing to see people open up and feel like mm -hmm. they can explore with technology, especially people who may not have explored it, um, you know, um, when they were younger. So they're like coming to it later. I, I want them to embrace that, that, that part of the mythology. So that's warm. I want them to feel like they can explore. I love seeing their eyes wide open just like look at all the possibilities look what i figured out i didn't even need anybody's help that's the magic that's great about hacking right so i get that that's been overused and then in security obviously it's overused as well right um, mm -hmm. um you know i'm sure you've had meetings with people they go i mean if i had a dollar for every time i was in a meeting with security people both socially or um you know, in, in actual security situations go, but I'm, I'm not a hacker. I give them a hug. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. But, <laughs> but I will also say that and I'm also a hacker purist in a way, like for me, it means breaking into systems. And if you're not, if you haven't done it, then you're not. I mean, I think, I mean, the people who came before me would take issue with that. I don't know if you remember, um, I'm not going to say the word because it's offensive, but they, remember when they, they used the C word, uh, mm -hmm. the original yep. 60, 70 hackers were like, you guys aren't hackers. You're the C word. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So, yep. I mean, I think like, I understand, I mean, definitely I'm, you know, so I'm definitely biased because for me, hackers definitely meant, yo, breaking into systems, raw systems is hacking. But that being said, I do think the spirit and ethos is important. And I love that so many people have embraced it. So I definitely have two minds about it um, on that subject. Um, um, I, I think there's a way, I think they both resolve together and stuff. I mean, if if I'm in like a, in the room with people who, who know, like like we were just talking about like the old stuff, um, you know, obviously that's like, we're getting down to the real, real deal hacking, but that's also the culture that that's the, also the phase where the culture blew up. Like you don't have all the other pieces it evolved from that time period. That was a, that was the exploratory, exploratory time. And the, where a lot of the elements were formed, both how we communicate, how we, um, to some extent, even dress some of the accoutrements. Um, the tools of the trade um, 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 all evolved out of there. Even the software, everything evolved from the thinking, the discussions, the conversations, 
the hacking. Um, um, so when I see this stuff now, it's still going to evolve. I see changes that make me happy, but I also see a lot of stagnation too, unfortunately. Like I said, that's just part of the growth of having to have such an expanded industry instantly. Not everyone is going to be a hacker or know how to hack. And that's okay. Like I said, there's elements we still need um, in, in, in those chess pieces when you're talking about security, but ultimately everybody would be served better if there were more pure hackers. Well, let me ask you an, a, hopefully an objective question on that. I mean, we, we've talked about Tiger Team and, hap- ha- and having the diversity of skills and everybody bringing something different to the table. It, it, to your way of thinking, how many of those people on the team, however big and diverse it is, need to be by definition of hacker? Or does hacker gravitate to, to one or more of the specific skills? Well, like I was saying, like when I was talking about how like I wound up working for some billionaires, right? Like everyone Mm -hmm. needs like a pure hacker around. Like they just, it's just a whole other mindset. Just like certain Mm -hmm. organizations have like an 11th man, like you need someone on the outside, like an ombudsman sort of thing. Or like I said, other cases called the 11th man. Like you need the person who thinks up the worst possible scenarios so then you can plan for them or, you know, or when they make a scenario that everyone thinks is bulletproof, you need the asshole in the room that punches a hole in it. And the hacker yep. can do that. Hacker can yep. be like, yo, I mean, people hate that guy, but yo, he's like, yo, this whole shit doesn't work. Check this out. There's a hole in it. Mm. Yo, but we got to go to production. We can't, we're going to ignore that hole, but you need that guy to make that statement and well, like more times than not that guy can be pushed down or people don't actually want that guy around because yeah. it's, it's uh, let's face it. I was going to say, security. Yeah. I, I am that guy. I've been that guy. It's, it's not a popular position and you get fired a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Unfortunately that is, that's the thing. So what I, I, so me discussing this in a lot of ways is to say, there's a way to have that guy. And respect what he does and have it, you know, have him as an 11th man doesn't mean you know, you can ignore the warning and do what you have to do. Because let's face it, harsh security does it affects productivity. Um, but that's why another way into me is like making it like a tapestry within lifestyle would make it a lot easier. But like for but in that particular case, like you need that guy. Because that guy will help you and save you a lot of pain further down the road. Right. Right. Yeah. No, that guy's unpopular. I'm sorry if you you face the axe from telling the truth on computer well, security. But, but uh, well, what I've tried to do, uh, and I, I and I've had I think some some success more recently. I haven't always been this way, but I think people. Uh, when they encounter that person, that twelfth, that twelfth man, that person that's the naysayer, the the grumpy, seeing everything wrong, um, there's a tendency to be dismissive of them. So, you know, to my way of thinking as a hacker, it's being that person trying to come up with creative, different ways of. And somebody gave me an expression. Uh, back in my DOD days, you, you need to come up with the ability of, of uh, being able to, to share the bad news, but doing it in such a way so that the other person is pissing on it and making it think, it, think that it's their idea. That's always, that's even when I'm doing film stuff, you have to, <laughs> that's yep. the old adage and it works every time you have to give them a, you have to give them a piece of ownership on it. That is yep. definitely how you have to break it. You have to lead them to believe that they came up with the idea. It's difficult. Um, yep. On one hand, it seems like ridiculous. It seems like what's wrong with this person that their ego is out of control. But sometimes it's just, they just have to have a piece of it and feel like they had a part of it. It's it's almost like whenever you're trying to uh, change somebody's opinion on subjects, um, everything from religion to politics, you can't attack them to make them change their mind. They become very defensive of it. And that's mm-hmm. what happens a lot of time in those positions is that that person's reputation is on the line. And by not giving them a piece of it, 
they feel like you're attacking them, that they are not good at what they do, that they made a mistake. So you have to present it properly. And that's something that comes with time and wisdom and a few mistakes yep. of, you know what I mean? Being brash, <laughs> oh, yeah. saying all this shit's fucked. And then, you know, and getting you kicked out on your ass, then you realize, oh shit, maybe I need a little tact. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, uh, life lessons that I, I like to think I've learned a few along the way, but I still fail miserably. I'll, I'll be honest. <laughs> it's a you lifelong know, process to learn. Yeah. J- J- JT, you've actually uh, touched on this and actually hinted at it a couple of times. You're talking about, you know, j- just people evolving and security evolving, et cetera. And, and you know, we just had the Hacker Valley Studio uh, gang on board. And obviously, they're now in, in media. I know that that's actually one of your big things. We talked a little bit about your past, but I would love to talk about your present and, and how you actually made that switch into media and, and why and, and how you believe that actually still, you know, honors your, your hacker ethos and things like that. Gotcha. So, all right. So in terms of uh, uh, media, so one of the things that so I have two careers I developed. One is a futurist where like I consult with like think tanks about the future with the, with the, um, the vector of hacking computer security, but more hacking in general, because like I said, ultimately that's a a lay, a cultural layer we now have in, 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 in our society, um, is here to stay as far as we can tell. And, um, so with that regard, like I've become like, sort of like someone that like helps think about, those things, whether it's like on policy or creative or, you know, a myriad of things from government to art, like you have to consider those things. Um, So that's another way to like stay abreast of like all the different currents in our society and how those are affected by hacking, both from specific events to, like I said, to undulations in our, in, in the cultural layer. Um, but the other one is that I started working as a director and a writer telling stories. And the reason I got into that is because honestly, I have to admit like the computer security for me, I'm a hacker. I like to break in. So it was difficult. Like, and ultimately you can't stay a pen tester or, or, or breaking in forever for various reasons. One, um, you only can stay good for so long. I'm still fucking good, but I mean, you only can stay good for so long, right? You know, just, you know, when you're 20, yo, you can fucking blaze away at that shit as you get older and you got life, you know, people expect things of you. There's no way you can focus on being the fucking best anymore. Um, that's my take on it. I mean, yo, maybe there's somebody out there right now that's 60 and killing it. Yo, props to you, man. But man, you must have no time for anything else. But I, you know, I also, so that's one part of it. But the other part too, yeah, it's just, it's just that that's the part I like the best. Um, so for me, like moving to a managerial position wasn't uh, for me. Um, so I moved to film to tell stories because I always, uh, I think the hacking thing, I think there's so many different stories to tell in that realm. Um, I don't just do hacker stories, but, you know, I definitely have a specific uh, uh, bend on that subject. Um, And like I said, there's so many stories worldwide um, to touch on that technology touches on and hackers touch on that. Like, yeah, we haven't we're only going to start to see great hacker stories emerge in the next little bit. I think we've been sort of starved out on some really good hacker stories uh, lately um, mostly because the mythology kind of got wrapped up a lot around, um, you know, uh, <clears throat> uh, certain, uh, boring people who didn't really break into much, but, um, <laughs> uh, who r- remain unnamed at the moment. But, um, I think, uh, but just in general, those stories got tapped out and were dull and didn't resonate with anybody. So the next slate of hacker stories that we see, you know what I mean? From from Mr. Robot on will be incredible and probably more resonant with um, society and with um, people young and old. So I'm working hard on such stories. Um, um, and right now I'm in the middle of developing a film called The Memory Thieves um, about a young woman who figures out how to steal people's memories. Um, and uh, it's coming along pretty fucking good. <laughs> man that's great jo- uh 
JT, I could talk to you for hours, and we need to get together sometime and swap stories. Are you a cigar smoker, per chance? I will. I will. For you, I will smoke a cigar, and of course, of course. the yes. Uncle Nearest will be <laughs> at the ready. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, we we can we can smoke some Emperor's Cut cigars. It's a black owned cigar company. Nice. Uh, who are the nice. ones that told me about? Give me a V cut, Let's, please, and let's get with it. All right, sounds good, man. I can't. Yeah, by the way, I can't wait to, to get Cuba? my vaccination now. Yeah, I have not. You know, Paul Asadorian, who runs this whole show, also has a a, a cigar podcast called Stogie Geeks, and oh, uh, you know, back when when Obama was starting to open up relations with Cuba, we started talking about, man, we should just do a day trip and just go down there, and well, maybe a couple of days, and just do the whole c- cigar thing in Cuba, and then the last four years has been, you know, how many times yeah. can you drop the f bomb on the last four years? So, uh, <laughs> right. Uh, no, but it's on the bucket list. Uh, and I know Paul, when he listens to this show, he's going to want to have you on our main show, which is called Paul Security Weekly, and want to get together and hang out with you sometime. Um, you yeah, know. let's do it. And also, don't forget Matt That's Mitchell. Good. Bring Matt Mitchell. Yes, on. yes, we got we, we got to yes, get absolutely. Matt. Like Matt, Matt definitely needs to be on the show. That's my boy. Yeah, but yeah. definitely go to Cuba as soon as you. Once everything is all clear with this COVID thing, I highly recommend mm-hmm. it. Um, hopefully, uh, you know it's just. Not wrapping it in politics. Look, I've been throughout the Caribbean. It's an amazing place, a synthesis of, of you know, of 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 Europe and Africa, and 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 the indigenous cultures. And it's just like this amazing mix. And Cuba is a special mm-hmm. island. It's the largest island in the Caribbean. And I just uh, I won't go into details, but the cigars are the gateway to an amazing culture. Well, you know, a couple of years ago I was in uh, San Juan, Puerto Rico. Um, and I was asking Paul before I went down there, it's like, well, tell me about cigars in Puerto Rico. It's like, I don't know that much about them because they don't import them into the U S even though they're a territory. Um, if you go to Puerto Rico and you talk to the cigar makers and, 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 and the guys at the cigar shops, uh, they will tell you that um, Cuba has their tobacco and cigar industry to thank for Puerto Rico because apparently back in like the 1910s or 20s, the all the tobacco crops got wiped out in Cuba of some sort of disease or something, mm-hmm. and Puerto Rico saved the day by shipping them a bunch of seeds to sort of re- wow. reboot right, the industry. That. So. We need to do the whole Caribbean is what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, man. And then I heard Jamaica's running out of weed. So, yeah, man. I think <laughs> somebody needs to come save Jamaica. America needs to give them some save seeds Jamaica. or something. <laughs> All right. Who knew well, Jamaica uh, would run out of weed? <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us today, and thanks again to uh, to Ron and Chris. Check them out at Hacker Valley uh, Studios, HackerValley dot com. Uh, Flea, good job. Way to pull some 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 good people together. And we'll have you back sometime in some way, shape, or form, JT. And uh, I'm looking forward to getting my vaccination now, so we can hang out. That's going to wrap yeah. us for us. Uh, today on Security and Compliance Weekly. Tune in next week. Uh, we might just be talking about something like uh, cyber cyber insurance, one of our favorite hot topics. So uh, over and out. We'll see you next week.